Hello and welcome to our uh, webinar today on writing resumes. Uh, the aim of today's webinar will be to provide you with a starting point so that you can take charge of writing your own resume. You do, you'll find you're gonna need a resume for most jobs you apply for these days, so it's essential that you do get this right. You might find you'd like to update your resume with some of the recommendations from today. And from there on, you'll be able to get some personalised feedback from the careers team on your campus. So we either have options for face-to-face -face phone or Zoom appointments, uh, where we can then give you some um, detailed feedback on your document. Just before I go into resumes, I'm just going to quickly plug our services here. Uh, so across all campuses, we offer career services to our students uh, in the form of different appointments. We have a 30 minute careers consultation. We also have 15 minute appointments on feedback for resumes, cover letters. Um, we might, you might need assistance with preparing for an interview, for example. Uh, also things like careers events and workshops, we run a whole range of those throughout the year across the different campuses and they were all listed on the careers page on the um, Latrobe site. So please take a look at our services and get involved in any way that you can. On to resumes. So a resume is a document that summarises your key qualifications, skills, experience and qualities. Resumes are a standard part of the job application process and employers want to see information on your resume that's relevant to the position they want filled. It's a marketing document that you, communicates your unique mix of skills. Your resume is a document that will change regularly as you apply for different roles. So it needs to be constantly reviewed and revised to ensure it's relevant to the role you're applying for. This means you're gonna to need to adapt or tailor your resume to each role and organisation you apply for. Employers can very easily detect generic resumes and regard these documents poorly, quickly ruling your application out. To tailor your resume, think about what you're applying for and how the information you are presenting is relevant to both the role and the organisation. Consider it a piece of persuasive writing where you're arguing your point to a potential employer of your suitability to the role. Use evidence to support your argument that you are the best fit for the role with examples of how you meet your competencies. And argue this using concise language, using well-written dot points rather than large chunks of text. Keep your, your presentation and your layout professional. Does it show meticulous attention to detail? Does it flow? Is the formatting consistent? Remember the primary purpose of a resume is to get you to an interview stage. So it really needs to look its best. So when deciding what to include, this list is a pretty good indication of the order of information we generally look for. We also have some advice on what not to include. Things like a photo, your date of birth, your marital status, um, your religion, anything personal like that these days doesn't need to go on a resume and, and really shouldn't. I'd also consider not even including your address these days. While you might be happy to travel an hour across town to a job, some employers might be concerned about your willingness to do this long term. You might not always get shortlisted. For any work that isn't local, I would probably keep your address off. And of course, the opposite is the case for local jobs. Most employers like hiring local staff, so use your judgment when deciding on when to include or leave out your address details. Tell us about all of your experiences and achievements, including any volunteering or involvement in extracurricular activities. And your referees will always be the last section of your resume. And just on that note, make sure they're people who have had a professional relationship with you, such as a supervisor or academic as we don't use personal referees. For a professional resume, education should sit prominently on the first page. It's often one of your major selling points and sometimes the only relevant industry experience that you're going to have. It's vital to include any academic achievements or anything noteworthy that you might have done. Um, so things like, have you been a recipient of a scholarship or an award? Um, were you invited to join Golden Key, for example? Anything like this should certainly go on it. Um, don't, I wouldn't particularly list the results in your resume unless they are especially good. Um, maybe a, a wham over 80, for example, I would probably uh, write it out as, you know, you achieved a weighted average mark of 84, for example. Um, I certainly wouldn't be putting, you know, marks in the 50s and that sort of thing on there. 
Um, and there's really no need to list subjects. You might want to put one or two that are relevant, but by, um, we certainly don't want to see a large list of you know, every subject you've done since you've been here. So just keep them relevant. Um, you can expand on any masters, projects, honours thesis, or anything like that that you've done. Um, you could also include that in its own section where you can unpack it further to really articulate the skills you've developed, the objectives that you met, you know, final results, that sort of thing. Uh, in this section, don't include certificates. So um, create another heading like additional certifications or training or something like that, um, which will sit further along in your CV. So things like having a responsible service of alcohol, you're working with children's check, um, those kind of things, we don't need to put them, group them with education. Uh, so give that their own section further along in the resume. Um, as you progress through your career, your experience will become more important than your education. Uh, and in which case your qualifications will move down the line on your resume until, you know, well into your career, education will probably be one of the last or almost last things on your resume. And remember, unless you're a first year student, we don't need to see high school on your resume. That ship has sailed, so time to let it go. Um, it should really just be undergraduate and postgraduate education that's listed there. Any involvement in your professional industry should always be included in a professional resume. Um, these things show to employers your commitment to your profession, industry knowledge and experience you've developed in addition to your degree. Um, so some courses have mandatory placements, which must always be included, obviously. Um, others allow you to pursue an internship either for credit or as a self-sourced opportunity. And once again, you should definitely feature these in your resume. Voluntary experience can be very relevant to what you're studying and a great alternative to interning. Um, volunteering at a community organisation, for example, where you might write newsletters and manage social media. Um, you know, when you're studying media and comms, for example, or marketing, um, is a great way to gain some invaluable experience. Are you part of a professional association? Or, you know, thinking about joining one could be something you look into. Student memberships to these can often be very cheap or sometimes free and show the employer that you are very invested um, within that industry. Have you gone off and done some additional professional development in addition to your studies here? Maybe you've attended a weekend conference, for example, um, on something that you are studying. Once again, tell us about it. And are you part of a relevant student association here on campus? You know, think about, um, you know, maybe you're part of the accounting students club and you're studying accounting. You're going for an accounting role and you are showing that employer, I am all about accounting. I'm heavily invested in this world. So once again, something important to show us. So a couple of tips that we'll work through here. So the layout, it needs to be professional, it needs to be easy to read, which sounds all very obvious. Employers only gonna to continue to read your resume if it looks professional, relevant, and easy to follow. This major layout needs to look professional, but also be quite simple and uncluttered at the same time. If it's too busy looking or too hard to read or follow, employers just won't read it. They don't have the time. Use a simple common font, um, something like Calibri, uh, and I tend to use an 11 point for that. I certainly wouldn't go smaller than 10 and I wouldn't go higher than 12 size font. I find a non-serif font is much easier on the eye and you should always consider your reader. You want them to be able to easily read your resume. Keep your font consistent throughout the resume and ideally it should be the same one that's also used on your cover letter. Avoid graphics or fancy fonts, tables and columns as they can be hard to read and they can't always be scanned easily. Resume scanning software doesn't read tables very well, so I would leave them out where you can. Um, and I'd also be wary of resume templates on the internet. A lot of them have unnecessary sections and unnecessary graphics. Um, I find a lot of them are tailored to a one page American resume market and really not suited to our um, resumes that we do here. Sometimes students I find make the mistake of sacrificing the content of their CV to the restrictions in space or layout from these um, standardised templates. 
um, which is never a good idea. So I would stick with probably, you know, good old Microsoft Word and just do your own. And finally, we always use dot points for details. Why? They're quicker to read and they really do force you to be a lot more concise. Now, when we talk about dot points, there's, a, there's two ways that you can do these. I find there's a right way and there's a wrong way. As we can see, this example is the same job talked about, you know, articulated twice. Top version, bottom version. Obviously, to start off, they look a lot different. Um, but we're talking about exactly the same job, which is a sales assistant role in a clothing store. So top version is a classic two to three word dot point that tells me very little about what you've done. This is commonly used in resumes, but it's generic. It's very boring to read. Um, it's also quite literal. Things like you handled cash, you greeted customers. Um, we don't need that level of detail. These are all things people can or have done in their lives and they really don't belong on a resume. Um, using something like customer service is really ambiguous, really doesn't tell me much about what you've done at all. Have a little faith in your reader. If the job title is sales assistant, then most of us can work out what sort of work the job involved. We know you serve customers, we know you put out stock, you use the cash register. So you don't need to tell us that stuff. Think instead about what you did that we might not actually know about. Even better, think of things you've done that you can do again in future roles or of skills you've developed that would easily sit in a professional role. When we look at the second version, this is significantly more detail involved and I get a much better idea of the things this candidate has to offer a potential employer. Things like training new staff, organising rosters, or being able to de-escalate challenging customer behaviours show a skill set that is highly transferable to other settings. Keep these two examples in mind when you're writing about your own experiences. And finally, use dot point for details, but we do write them out as full sentences. So get the basics right. Obviously, we need your name, your email and your phone. Um, as I said earlier, uh, address is, you know, you, you'll use your um, judgment on that one. You may also wish to use your LinkedIn address as well if you want. Um, but just make sure if you do use that, it's a full LinkedIn profile and not one of, you know, a bare bones record. Um, if you don't have LinkedIn, that's fine. You don't need the word resume on your resume or little titles like name, email, mobile. We can work out what they are without them needing their own title. Check your contact details. Make sure you've got a professional email address. Um, you know, just stick with your name at Gmail or whatever. Um, nothing silly or, um, you know, inappropriate. Check your spelling. Um, spelling errors, even one, can drastically reduce your chance of progressing to the next round. Employers want to see attention to detail. They want to be confident in your communication skills. Check any documents you submit to an employer thoroughly. We use expressive verbs or action words to really enhance your resume. So think about starting each dot point with things like designed, developed, implemented, initiated, advised, modified, they can make even the most simple of tasks sound professional. Every dot point should always start with an expressive verb. Now page one is where the reader will spend most time. So make sure your most important information, such as your qualifications, academic achievements and relevant experience are on this page. As a general rule, present your most recent education and employment first and work backwards. So that's what we call reverse chronological order. And for most graduates, two to three pages is sufficient. Um, no one's got time to read a five page resume, despite how wonderful you might be and you wanna tell us a whole lot of stuff. It just won't get read. So try and stick to that two to three page rule um, wherever you can. And just remember, part-time professional resumes are quite different. Uh, they have different uh, order of information, different sections. A part-time resume, for example, would have a section on your availability, whereas you'd never mention that in a professional one. So just make sure if you've, you know, applied for a job with a supermarket lately, it's not going to be the same one you use um, when you're going for your graduate role. So 
tailor your resume, um, just as with a cover letter, there, there is no one size fits all standard one that you'll use for every job. A generic resume is normally pretty obvious to recruiters and suggests you weren't that bothered to you know, go to much effort to apply. It doesn't really create a great impression, um, will certainly reduce your chance of getting an interview. You need to make your resume a better fit by making the information relevant to the specific role by highlighting the qualification skills experience that you have that are needed by that particular employer for that specific job. Take a look at the language used in the job ad and use it in your resume and cover letter. Software programs that scan resumes look for keywords. So if the advert's consistently talking about team player, for example, make sure you're using that throughout your resume. And finally, open a resume with a profile or a professional summary. This provides the employee with a snapshot of who you are and what you have to offer in a couple of lines. So communicating your skills can be a bit of a problem sometimes. So um, once again, we've got two versions here to talk about, to show us the skills that you're looking at. The top example is what we commonly see, uh, certainly what I see when I review resumes here at Career Ready. The information is all your opinion. No evidence is given to support how you are highly organised, for example. Um, so it's not telling me a great deal. I see these skills lists and I find they add zero value to resumes and most of the time I will cross a, put a big cross through them and um, suggest that they get taken off the resume. If you really wanna talk about your skills in a resume and have a separate skills section, uh, the bottom uh, version is what we would recommend here. So for example, your organisational ability, you might be going for a job, um, in events management where you really need to be a fantastic organiser, how can you express that without just saying, I'm highly organised? Well, you can give a couple of examples. So you can use examples from, you know, uni, part-time work, placements, extracurricular activities you're a part of. But you're giving me some examples of where you've been organised. Um, even more when you can quantify those and you can give me some data on um, numbers of people you've worked with or uh, number of people that you've organised gives even more weight to that. So if you are going to have a skills section, the bottom one is what we would want to see. And just on that, tell me about the skills that are relevant only. I don't need to see a huge page full of different skills um, where they're for things that the job doesn't even call for in the first place. We would certainly only do a couple, um, so certainly wouldn't be looking for a page of a skills list, for example. Um, but yeah, there is, this is the right way and the wrong way. Um, so please be mindful of this. My, my problem with the first version as well is some of this stuff that we see on these skills lists are also things that we would expect anyway. So saying things that's like, I'm honest or I'm reliable, I would expect that in someone I'm hiring anyway. That shouldn't be something that you need to separately tell me specifically. Um, I see a lot of people put punctual, things like that too. If you're getting paid, you're expected to show up to work on time. That's not a bonus that you've, you know, you've got to work on time. So they would really be things you definitely don't need to include. So tell us about your achievements. They can be a real point of difference on resumes. And I think things um, that are often overlooked on uh, a number of the resumes that I've certainly looked at. They're a wonderful way of showing potential employees the value you could add to their business. They not only show what you've done under each job listed, but also what you did that worked well. So achievements are about results and recognition. So what have you done that was a success? And can you quantify these successes? Um, we talked earlier about academic achievements. So, you know, high wham, being invited to join Golden Key, winning a scholarship, those kind of things. What have you done in your job? Maybe you received a customer service award or the obvious ones like employee of the month or, you know, maybe you got consistently good feedback from others on your performance. Have you been promoted or recognised for a contribution you might have made to the business? Did you significantly increase the number of followers of an organisation's social media page, for example, after you took over managing their account? 
and think about extracurricular activities. Did you have a leadership role in a student club or, facility or faculty? Did you raise money for charity? Were you a high achiever in a sporting or artistic pursuit? If so, tell us all about it. So my final recommendation, once you've written your resume, is to really check it thoroughly for typos, for poor use of grammar, and even your formatting. Once you've done that, you wanna get some feedback. Um, so you've got some options there. You can certainly get friends or family to have a look at it, but you can certainly get some professional feedback from the careers and employability team. Uh, where you're able to book in for a one-on-one, 15-minute -on -one, appointment, and we can really go through and refine the content in your resume without sort of spending time on things like fixing your formatting. So we would expect that you can work on that, all of that already. Um, as I said, you can book a face-to-face -face appointment, um, and depending, or depending on what campus you are, it might be a phone appointment or a Zoom appointment. Um, if you are coming in to see us, we just ask you to bring in a printed copy. It makes it a little bit easier to work with. Um, we can mark things and circle things and throw arrows and all that kind of thing. So just bear that in mind if you're um, coming to see us in person. And just before I finish up, I'm just going to quickly touch on Career Ready Advantage. Um, this is our Employability Award Program and something that we would really recommend um, all the Trobe students participate in a way of enhancing your own employability. This was developed in consultation with employers who told us what they were looking for in graduates. By engaging in a range of learning and practical activities, you'll build on your skills and learn how to better articulate your career story to future employers in job applications and interviews. You can access Career Ready Advantage through the LMS and more information about it can be found in the careers page or just on the Latrobe site. So for example, today, um, by listening to this webinar, this would already count as one professional learning module. And for silver level, you're gonna to need to do four. So you've already done a quarter of those. Um, also, the resume um, counts as one of the career portfolio pieces. So you have to do three of those for silver. And so working on your resume today after this webinar and submitting it to us, there's another thing done. So you'd be well on your way to um, getting a few pieces already done. So in closing, that's it for resumes for today. I hope this webinar has been helpful. Remember, you're more than welcome to get some individual feedback on your resume, um, depending on which campus you are. So um, if you'd like to come in and see us or you'd like to have a phone appointment, um, either way, you can, uh, Book all of that through the careers page. And thank you for listening. I hope this has been um, helpful and interesting and best of luck with your resumes.